Welcome to the Art of Procurement Podcast with your host, Philip Eitzen. Here, thought leaders share the trends, strategies, and tactics that you can use to elevate the role of procurement and your career. Hi, everyone, and thanks for hitting the play button today and listening in to another Art of Procurement interview, where we hope to elevate our impact one conversation at a time. And today's guest is Jonathan O'Brien. So Jonathan is the CEO and a founding member of Positive Purchasing. He has over 25 years of experience working with household names uh, around the world to help transform procurement capabilities. And Jonathan also works with executive teams to shape and implement procurement strategies while training, coaching and developing procurement teams to perform and realize their potential. So many listeners may recognize Jonathan. He's the author of a number of procurement-related books, including The Definitive Guide to Supplier Relationship Management. Um, Jonathan just released the second edition of that book. And so I invited him on the show to talk about advanced supplier relationship management strategies. So without further ado, let's go straight into my first question, where I asked him, did he find procurement or did procurement find him? Well, procurement chose me. Um, I'm not sure that um, that many people actually make a conscious decision to go into procurement, but um, I, I, in fact, uh, didn't have any intention right. of going into procurement many years ago. Um, I ended up there. Uh, I'm an electronics engineer by mm-hmm. background, and because of an opportunity in an organization that I worked in, they had a senior buyer, they had no one to fill it, and they they thought, you know, what's the worst can, that can happen? <laughs> I'd never intended to stay in the role, um, but I got into the role and realized that it was really quite underdeveloped and there's a lot of work that needed to be done there. And I got excited about the prospect of actually trying to make it better. Mm-hmm. Um, and, uh, and I'm still in procurement and I'm now very passionate about trying to help others to be able to do that very same thing. Yeah, it's interesting when I, when I ask that question, because I always really enjoy asking it because it gives an insight into kind of uh, people's career journeys and um, I would say 99% of people never really intended or understood what procurement was when they got into it. We kind of all f- fell into it and then uh, stuck with it. We enjoyed it so much that we stuck with it. We, we ask that question when we do some of our training courses, in fact, actually. And um, there is a generational divide. Mm-hmm. And uh, younger, uh, younger audiences, younger delegates will say, I've chosen to be in procurement. And they've actually studied to become a procurement professional. So there is a generation coming through that want to make it a career. Um, and then there's the rest of us that kind of ended up in there and are still hanging in there. <laughs> do you see a difference in the skill sets perhaps or maybe it's approaches or attitudes in in folks who have actually studied to be in procurement who come into the profession versus those of us that fell into it um, I think it's an interesting one because um, when I look at the people that have studied to, become, to, to come into procurement, there are sort of two camps there. There are the camps that have come through, um, through maybe a university route and have studied in that way who tend to have a good uh, grounding. And there are others who have perhaps come through the institutions. And that's quite different, actually. That, mm-hmm. uh, that perhaps is less well-developed, um, sadly, um, versus the people that have learned this through uh, customer practice and experience. Experience. So they will apply the, the, the kind of traditional methods to something, but maybe not think in some of the modern ways, some, using some of the modern approaches, the modern tools that um, are beginning to make procurement much more strategic and looking at sort of game-changing benefits to an organization. So yes, there are differences there, um, and, uh, and, and I'm not quite sure how quickly that's going to kind of um, get to a place that, that's going to be beneficial for the industry. Do you find that there's more people who want to be in procurement today than um, perhaps, I don't know, 10, 20 years ago? I think so, because procurement suddenly quite an interesting place to work. You know, once upon a time, procurement was the function that bought stuff right. um, uh, or perhaps did tenders and contracts. Uh, and actually, people are now saying, you know, in forward-thinking organizations, they're watching the procurement team um, actually working at a strategic level, part of groups that are designing new things, that are innovating, that are developing things. And procurement are there, and they're working with suppliers, and they're traveling around, and, and they're, they're part of the, the real action in the company. So that's quite exciting. So, so what we're seeing is people saying, well, hey, I want to be in that. 
um, um, it's, uh, it's almost as exciting as being in marketing. So I think you're kind of getting to this place where, um, you know, it's a really good place to be, and that's being recognized. Yeah, I think it, it's pro- there's probably differences by geography as well. I'm sure, you know, when you think about the maturity of the function, for sure in most of Europe, you know, procurement is a relatively mature function now, and a lot sure. of the rest of the world. And I, I think even, you know, where I'm sitting at the moment in North America, it's still pretty yeah. pretty much emerging in a lot of organizations and so when you're in yeah. uh, a lot of the universities here it still isn't really talked about as a you know a desirable function well let me t- take that back it's not necessarily not talked about as, de- as a desirable function it's not talked about at all so it's still you know yeah. supply chain perhaps marketing hr yeah. uh, the, the glamorous uh, career routes and i think we've got a little bit of work to do to put procurement on the map in the states at least yeah, and it's beginning. I think where it is on the map is if you go and work for, say, a big global global pharmaceutical company or a big uh, innovative tech company, that's when you see the difference. Mm-hmm. Whereas, um, you know, we do a lot of um, a, a lot of work all over the world in the, in the space, as you know. Um, we'll go to some North American companies, and procurement still contracting and tendering, yeah. and that's not glamorous. Yeah. Then you go to Latin America, you go to Asia, uh, and actually procurement isn't even quite doing that. It's just trying to figure out how to get stuff through the door. So yeah, big big differences. Um, but you know we're on a journey here, um, and um, I, I think the next ten or twenty years are quite exciting. So I, I just want to ask a little bit about some of your kind of beliefs and perspectives of you as you've kind of developed and progressed in your career. Are there some beliefs, or are there some kind of ways of being that have really shaped the journey that you, that you've taken? We've had the the fortunate. Um, uh, kind of track record to be able to work with lots of companies, uh, lots of individuals, and to see lots of procurement organizations of, of different mm-hmm. capabilities. Um, I think the, the the beliefs that have shaped that is actually it's all about people and it's about enabling people. Um, you, clearly, you need process, you need tools, uh, you need uh, capability, um, you, you need to have the organization position, you need governance, all of those things are essential. But actually, if people don't get it, if they're not aligned, if they're not motivated, if they're not interested, then nothing much happens. Yeah. So the, all of the procurement functions that, that we um, that we work with, the ones that manage to get people interested, aligned, working together, doing similar things, um, are those are the ones that um, that really begin to drive change and make things different. And I think I would add to that: it's not just the people within the procurement function, um, because if 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 it only lives in procurement, it doesn't really go very far. It has to be the people across the entire organisation. So procurement has to become the concern of the whole mm-hmm. organisation. It's an organization-wide philosophy um, and therefore if the, if the procurement function is just buying things and just contracting and tendering it will never really be that but if it's using strategic approaches like category management and supplier relationship management then um, you know and it's touching the all of the people who have relationships with suppliers or heart who or who are involved in buying specification um, or use of the goods and services then it begins to be something that gains traction. Do you think, um, because it brings up an interesting question, you know, that's always in my mind, in terms of our future role, you know, and we've, we've built a function around the act of procurement, I'd say over the last 20 years or so. And as we talk about integrating more with the business, do you see that there'll be a time when actually what we do isn't classed as procurement and a functional activity, but actually it's kind of rolled back into an organization and what we're doing is helping the organization perform the act of procurement. Yeah, definitely. And I I think one of the things that's going to drive massive change is um, how technology will drive a shift in how we buy stuff. So um, today, companies still need to to buy a lot of things and manage a transactional piece, whereas actually the the future um, in organizations that have very generic items, so take a healthcare company, uh, a healthcare provider buying a lot of wound care um, or um, surgical um, equipment, surgical gloves, those Mm -hmm. sorts of things, for example, um, today those organizations will have deals, contracts, and will work to buy those things. Tomorrow, 
they will be sourced from an Amazon type marketplace, right. a, a virtual marketplace that's just for that industry sector. Um, and so, so all of that spend will just be taken care of using technology uh, and market forces will drive prices of generic items down to, to the best place in right. the market. And you'll have access to that, just like we do when we buy stuff at home. And then we'll be left with all the specialist stuff, the unique stuff. So I think procurement will become a much, much more um, strategic looking function, looking at um, all of the other things that will enable the organization to be something different. Mm -hmm. So that shift is starting to happen now, um, and organizations are slow to, to adopt it. But that is the thing, I think, that will drive the biggest change in the next 10 to 20 years. Now, do you think that the organizations should be doing, procurement organizations or procurement leaders should be doing whatever they can to kind of get themselves out from under a lot of that tactical and transactional work? And when I say that, it's, I don't mean, um, you know, not supporting it. I just mean really accelerating the use of technology, bringing in guided buying or, um, you know, having a lot more kind of marketplace tools available for their people so that they become known as the organization that supports those more strategic activities. So it's kind of something that we're driving as opposed to somebody else coming and telling us, hey, procurement, this is what you're going to do for me. Yeah, it's an interesting question because the um, if you go to any of the procurement trade shows or um, seminars at the moment, people are talking about technology as the ne the enabler. Well, it, it's it's kind of got to be there, but that's not the thing that's going to drive the change here. For me, um, there it, there's a very clear model, and um, it's the three S model. It's the sourcing. Um, satisfying and strategic model. So um, procurement traditionally has looked after our supply base. We've looked after how the organization sources and buys its stuff. At the other end of the market, uh, at the other end of the organization, we have the traditional sales and marketing or whoever looks after the end customer satisfying end customer needs, wants, desires, aspirations. And then at the top of the organization, some sort of strategy. Yeah. Now, traditionally, that strategy is top down. Yeah. Um, and you could almost put a brick wall in the middle of the organization um, between uh, that separates how we source to how we satisfy. And strategy and how the organization drives itself forward unconnected with what procurement are doing other than providing some direction. Mm -hmm. and, and that is the model that is failing organizations today. Whereas if we start connecting those together, so supply-based possibilities inform strategy um, and also uh, connect with end customer needs and aspirations, you begin to get a model where um, actually procurement isn't a function that looks after suppliers, but rather procurement um, is an enabling function that makes the supply base that matters part of the organization. Mm -hmm. Now, that's the, that's the shift that has to happen. And yeah. that isn't a shift in procurement, but that shift has to happen by getting the executive team to see the possibilities of viewing procurement differently. Um, those across the entire organization, and especially sales and marketing, need to view procurement's role as integral to what they do. And when we've, we've changed the mindset of all of the organization, that's the point when we can restructure how we work and, by the way, bring the technology in to, to yeah. enable the taking care of the transactional stuff. So procurement can, to answer the question, procurement can help do that by attempting to change the mindset and the view of the senior team and the rest of the organization about what it's trying to do and the possibilities there. Yeah, I love the idea of it being about supply-based possibilities. I talk a lot about you know, thinking about what can we bring from a supply market into our organization so that we're actually integrating supply markets into what, into what our organizations do as opposed to, on the flip side, being somebody who transacts and buys to a specification, which is really what we're still, for the most part, doing across you know, a lot of the categories that we buy. And so, so I think that term, even supply-based possibilities, really personifies that a lot. Um, yeah, yeah. For me, you mentioned about one of the pillars of that being, you know, kind of opening the eyes to an organization of, of the art of the possible. How have you seen procurement leaders be successful in making that transition within the folks around them within a company? Yeah, 
Well, it starts in the, it starts with the executive team. So the procurement leader has to influence his or her peers that procurement actually is something that's going to change the game here. Mm-hmm. And that needs to drive differences in, in their behavior because um, procurement won't work unless we get cross-functional working happening. So the other peers on the executive team need to be able to um, convince support, resource their teams to be able to get involved with procurement projects. So so you you the change is about making procurement an organization-wide philosophy. See, suppliers don't belong to procurement. Right. Suppliers belong to the entire organization. Yeah. Categories aren't, the, aren't owned by procurement. They are the things that make the organization be able to do what it does. Um, and so when, when we get that shift to a less of a hierarchical functional structure um, and we, we make procurement something that runs through the entire organization, then we begin to drive that change. Mm-hmm. Well, I, I want to talk a little bit about supplier relationship management. Um, we'll, at the end of the show, we'll actually give a, uh, um, a shout out to the second edition of the book that you've just authored on supplier relationship management. Um, and that's really what I wanted to, uh, to focus our conversation on today. But before I go into some of the questions I have around SRM, I just wonder if you could actually define it because it's something that's often defined in different ways by different people and i think that provides some good context for the rest of the conversation yeah it does and i think you've 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 absolutely got it right there srm supplier relationship management is defined in many different ways and that's really the starting point so um although i've been working with companies and teaching um, srm and helping companies develop srm for many years when i came to write this book I had to define what it was, and mm-hmm. that was really difficult because the challenge here is um, if you talk to different people about SRM, they will hold in their minds very different meanings. So we're, we're using the same term, but different people mean different things by it. To, to some, um, it's about how you manage day-to-day stuff with suppliers yeah. who perhaps you spend a lot of money with. To others, it's about how you manage performance and derive performance improvements. Other people regard it as something you do in the supply chain. Then another group will regard it as something that's strategic with those um, small number of suppliers who are really important to us. So the problem is it means different things to different people. So in fact, actually what SRM is, is it's an umbrella term that describes all of the different types of intervention that an organization needs to deploy with those suppliers who are important to the organization in some way and maybe even strategic and the the nature of that intervention is designed specifically for those suppliers according to what makes them important Mm -hmm. so it's a very complicated way of explaining srm but it's about being able to know who's important why they're important and have the right interventions according to what makes them important and that means under SRM, we have different things we do to actually be able to um, get the most value we can from our supply base. So when you think about suppliers who are important, um, I'm sure you've seen this many, many times. I've certainly seen it a number of times, is that importance, the, the, the one driver of importance is, is often how much money do we spend with a company, yeah. Um, yeah. which just misses off so many mission critical suppliers. Um, and you know, I, in my yeah. experience, leads to focusing on a lot of the wrong partners. And I just wonder yeah. if, yeah. if from your experience, you know, there's there's other ways that you have seen organizations successfully define important that goes, you know, mm-hmm. above and beyond. Well, it's our top 100 spend suppliers. Yeah, and spend spend figures somewhere because it's a good place to start. Yeah. But the the one thing organizations should avoid doing is developing a spreadsheet model that aggregates um, some sort of scoring criteria applied against suppliers based on spend and perhaps some other factors. Because the, the moment you try and decide on importance based on spend alone, or indeed um, um, some sort of system that may add up um, uh, spend and future volumes and yeah. um, you know, whatever the criteria might be, um, you completely miss the ability to spot that one supplier who perhaps Today you're spending, I don't know, maybe um, you know a small amount of money with, but 
they hold some unique innovation, some unique technology, some unique capability that could change the game for you. The sort of supplier you might actually want to go and buy the right. company because they're that important. Yep. So traditional segmentation methods to figure out who's important just don't work. Um, and any method that looks to combine different factors together and, and aggregate them just doesn't work. Um, and um, so one of the first things we do when we work with companies is we say, look, let's come away from that. Um, let's look at the other different factors that make a supplier important. Um, and it's multidimensional. Um, when, we, when we run workshops with this to uh, help companies identify important suppliers, we don't have any fancy uh, spreadsheet mm -hmm. um, or algorithms to do it. We have big pieces of paper on the wall with um, graphics that consider multiple dimensions for any suppliers. And we have a team of people that move pieces of paper around a giant piece of paper on the wall till we get it right. Um, so we maximize the brain power in the room in a very interactive session. And we find that that is the only way to look at the multiple dimensions um, and make sense of who is truly important to, a, to an organization. Yeah, what's interesting to me is when you do the more traditional segmentation models, you end up with suppliers who are important to, for example, finance, perhaps, because that's where yeah. the money is spent, but it's not that are actually important to the, the the future strategy, the business objectives of the company, you know, where you may be working on a new product, for example, and one small supplier who you barely spend anything with can be fundamental to the future success of the business. And you just completely miss yeah. that because you're just focusing on um, the bigger numbers. Definitely. And add to that the fact that organizations are still largely measured in terms of um, financial measures and financial success. Um, and uh, it's very hard to, to do something that then pushes against that and says, well, actually, let's look at the particular value the supply base can bring us that will help build competitive advantage, help strengthen our brand, because you've got to, you've got to be brave to be able to say, this isn't about money, right. this is about um, being a leader in what we do. Um, and, but then marketing have been doing this for many years, and now it's our turn to be able to say, let's take a risk on this, because this could be big. Yeah, and you know, there'll be some organizations where cost is the ultimate arbiter of success because they're in a very low margin business and perhaps have some financial struggles. But the vast majority of businesses, it's only one component of what will make the company successful, isn't it? Definitely. Um, you, you mentioned when you talked about the definition of uh, supplier relationship management and how encompassing it is. As you, as you put that against the context of building an SRM program, is there such a thing as an end-to-end -end SRM program? Are you really looking at different elements um, that, you know, together collectively could make something bigger, if, if that makes sense? Because, you know, as I think of an SRM program, you, you traditionally think, well, it starts here and it ends there. But the way you defined it suggests mm, it's not quite so black and white as that. Yeah, there, there are elements that are, that are linear and have a sort of natural start and a finish. So developing a strategic collaborative relationship with a supplier that is strategic, you know, that, that, is a, that is a journey. You can start on that. You can figure out how the relationship should run. You can engage with the supplier. You can get joint working and innovation going with that supplier. And there's a series of things that you can do to make that happen. Whereas actually when we come back and look at the the supplier who uh, we have a range of important contracts with, perhaps high spend too, um, and that, that isn't a journey. That's a we need something in place that, that manages that supplier ongoing to make sure we get the, the total value from that. Mm -hmm. And there are other little touch points where from time to time we might need to do something. So imagine a situation where a supplier we wouldn't normally want to intervene with starts underperforming because of some issue and that issue could be significant to us all of a sudden we may want to temporarily measure performance monitor performance perhaps drive improvement perhaps even go and help that supplier if it is significantly mm -hmm. um, of interest to us until that problem can be can be um, overcome so um, actually, there's all sorts of different things that we do, and some of them are linear, some of them are constant, some of them are isolated activities. Do you see that the approach is different when you're managing direct spend versus indirect spend? 
Um, I think it depends on the nature of the business yeah. because uh, the the one the one thing about direct and indirect spend is um, it, it's ongoing um, in one form or another. So I think the challenges are the same. The context may be differently, may, may be different, but um, actually it's it's the same it's the same mm. interventions that we're using. So I want to talk a little bit about. Um, uh, now, I, I hesitate to use the term best in class because it's not something I particularly believe in because I think every situation is unique to the environment and the culture of the company that you're operating in. So so perhaps best practices is the best way of saying it. You know, a lot of people who are listening to the show will be working in organizations or have built uh, SRM programs where they're certainly doing the basics uh, and are perhaps wondering, okay, how can we now take this to the next level? We've, we've built a program that's functional, but how much value does it really add or does it have the ability to be a competitive advantage? And so I'd love your perspective on, on how, how can a company go from having that, we've checked the box and we've done the basics of an SRM program to one that's really making a difference. Yeah, I mean that's that's a great question, and you know that's probably the question that um, that a CEO would ask. Um, so I think if, if I put myself in the position of a CEO, the question is: Okay, so what value are we getting from our supply base, and is that right? Could we have more? Are we missing something? So that's a great that's a great starting point because to answer that question, it presumes that you understand the supply base. It presumes you know who's important, and it presumes that you can um, measure what value you're getting. Now, just answering those three questions, those are massive questions. Um, figuring out who's important, really, really hard thing to do. Um, we, we run workshops with companies to, uh, to figure out who are the important suppliers, and, and we've got an approach that allows companies to do it um, very rapidly. Um, other companies will pay big sums of money to big yeah. consulting firms to, to, to do the same thing. Um, so, you know, that is a big deal. Being able to, um, to, to then uh, understand the value that you're getting assumes that you've got mature ways of tracking benefits and beyond the financial benefits and, and quantifying and agreeing what, what value there is there. So I, I think that if you can answer those questions, um, then you've probably got a, a mature level of SRM in place. Mm -hmm. If you're still trying to answer those questions, then taking that next step is about um, figuring out what you need to do to be able to do that. Because once you understand who the important suppliers are truly, then you can think about the journeys that you need to go on to put those different things in place. Mm -hmm. Now, the big caveat here is any organization only has so much resource. Yeah. Um, so the, the, um, the, the error that companies make is they um, frequently uh, often design SRM approaches based on a set regime of interventions and actions. So um, the classic here is uh, developing the supplier importance pyramid with the transactional importance strategic suppliers, and then overlaying that with a set of rules that says, we have maybe 100 important suppliers, and we're going to do quarterly business reviews with all of those. We're going to have an annual meeting with somebody senior. We're going to do K scorecards, and we're going to put KPIs in place. That's the typical sort of SRM structure companies put in place. Mm -hmm. And then at the strategic level, it's much more. And if you take a step back, you say, okay, so that's four quarterly business reviews, 100 suppliers. We need a small army of people. Right. just managing our suppliers and you become um, uh, you become um, driven by the process rather than something that adds value yeah. a more grown up approach a more mature approach here is to say well look we have this resource available to us which suppliers could we go and spend time with um, and that's about making some, some big decisions to say well of the say 100 important suppliers we really don't need to have quarterly business reviews with many of them because we don't have an issue, because things, uh, things work well, but we do want to, to keep an eye on them. But then there's these other suppliers that we want to do something with. So it's about being able to develop unique approaches for each supplier mm -hmm. according to their unique situation. Yeah. That's a bit scary because when, 
when procurement um, starts talking about doing that, uh, it's very easy to think that feels a little bit out of control, um, and, um, and and shouldn't we shouldn't we be consistent here? But actually, that is the approach that allows us to really, really get to the next level when we talk about SRM. So it's interesting that in terms of one of the things that kept coming to my mind as you were talking there was the kind of trade-off between process and people. You know, we like to have the process in place because we can drive consistency, and yet you need the people to be able to execute it in a way that it becomes more than just a process. Um, how have you seen or how do you advise companies to kind of think about scaling that where you, you talked about not necessarily having all the rules that we may have in place? Um, so then it becomes very, you know, individualized. It's very much down to the ability of the person. How can we scale that? So we talk about the orchestra of SRM and we compare SRM to, to an orchestra where just like in an orchestra, you have different sections and those different sections play according to the music that's being played. So mm -hmm. each piece of music is unique, uh, and um, the sections will come in and come out uh, accordingly. Within SRM, we have different sections. We have supplier management. We have supplier performance measurement. We have driving improvement and development for suppliers. We have supply chain management, and we have strategic collaborative relationships for the yeah. critical few. And actually, each one of those is a section of an orchestra. Each supplier has its own unique piece of music. Um, and if we get the segmentation right, what we're doing is we're, uh, we're figuring out the music for that supplier. Mm -hmm. So when the orchestra plays, if we, just, if we have a supplier that we just need the stuff to, to turn up, to, to be fulfilled, we're doing day-to-day -day contract management because they're important to us. Maybe we have a supplier who's underperforming or we need to, we have a critical need to make sure something meets a particular specification. So we put a measurement regime in place. Maybe we need to ensure that there is no um, child labor or forced labor back up in our, our supply chains. So we put something to manage the supply chain in place mm -hmm. for another supplier. So the point is what we're doing <clears throat> is we're selecting the different types of intervention according to that supplier and the specific things that make them unique. And if we can have these individual tailored approaches, then, then it works. So within the orchestra, what we then do is we then equip um, the, the companies that we work with with the tools to be able to figure out what's the piece of music for that supplier, yeah. which sections are going to play, and therefore what do I need to do? Am I putting a scorecard in place, or am I going to go and run an innovation workshop mm -hmm. with a supplier to, to figure out what we, uh, you know, the next wave of value from them? Do you? Do you find that a QBR is still a part of most of those? Because that's you mentioned it before, you know, that's a traditional approach is, oh, let's just go and put in a bunch of QBRs and show up. And most of those QBRs end up being very tactical and, and you know, you kind of question the value that you get out of it. But I wonder, does that still play a role in an SRM program? It still plays a role, but I, I'm not a fan of, of QBRs right. because um, the, the, by their very name, quarterly business reviews, you're setting up a regime that you've got to have a meeting, yeah. and that assumes you have something to say. So what tends to happen is um, the buyer will structure an agenda, there'll be a nice conversation about, you know, this is what we're doing, this is what you're doing, anything new, any issues to talk about, and you almost kind of force the, the agenda to happen. And, you know, sometimes there might be a very real problem to discuss or an opportunity to discuss. To discuss. If that's the case, then there is a good reason to have a meeting. But actually, if you're just running through the standard agenda right. and the supplier is putting their time into producing performance statistics because that's what you expect of them, do you know what? That really does little. It's just a QBR for the sake of a, of a QBR. Yeah. The, uh, taking a different perspective, what, what is important for us to do for the suppliers that matter to us is to get to know them. Because if we know them, we are monitoring risk mm -hmm. and identifying if anything is going wrong that we might need to respond to. We are exploring possibilities with them, um, and we're, we're making sure that we are staying close to the things that matter. Um, actually, what is often more productive is not to have necessarily a time limit uh, or a set frequency and not necessarily to take in a meeting. It is sometimes more productive to go and visit the supplier, if it's right. a manufacturing company, to go and see them, um, but to create a reason to not have a meeting, but 
just understand what each other is doing. And you know, the other thing, especially for strategic suppliers, um, just socializing with them. And, um, you know, clearly it's, it's important that that isn't socializing in, in a way um, where we're expecting the supplier to pay, but in a scenario where we're trying to work jointly with a supplier, actually getting to know the people at a social mm-hmm. level um, can, can be more productive than anything formal we can ever do. And, and doing that within the constraints of, you know, sharing the cost and making sure that there's nothing in there um, that, would, that would ever cause concern to the organizations that we work with. Yeah, I, I couldn't agree more. You know, it's very much what we do is a people to people business at the end of the day and working with suppliers and building those relationships is people to people. And in fact, some of those formal QBRs. So as part of my background, I've delivered procurement outsourcing services and been responsible for building QBR decks. And, you know, that sometimes takes away from the relationship because it's very kind of, you know, you're wanting to paint the best picture of uh, to position yourself in the best light and it's not necessarily matches the reality of the day-to-day relationship so so many things get missed because there's this desire to put together a nice looking deck and and statistics that look great without actually getting to underlying issues and when you make it a little less formal i think that's where some of the more underlying issues if they exist or even opportunities to collaborate really come out definitely yes um I know that we're running out of time, so I have one last question, um, and that's related to the the book. So you wrote uh, Supplier Relationship Management, Unlocking the Hidden Value in Your Supply Base. And I think you wrote the first edition uh, back in 2014, I believe, and then the second edition yep. is uh, being released just as we speak. Um, yeah. in, the, in the four years between the first and the second edition, What's changed? You know, is is SRM evolving so quickly that um, that there was so much of an update that was needed to the first edition of the book? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, I don't think it's evolving so quickly. Um, I think organisations are only just beginning to to figure out what it is and how how to begin to apply it. But I I did the update because there because I learned more mm-hmm. um, from the first edition that I really wanted to bring into the second edition. And there are two areas where, where I learned more. Um, and uh, the first is, is around how you make this work in the organization. Um, so one of the key bits in, in the second edition is the introduction of what I've called the seven facets of SRM. Mm-hmm. So just like you have a precious stone, you have seven faces, seven facets of SRM, the seven things that have to work together to make SRM work in an organization and across the whole organization. And we've actually touched on many of those uh, during this, this broadcast. We've talked about the SRM has to be driven from the strategy of the organization mm-hmm. um, and respond and inform that. Um, it's about being clear about what is it you want from the supply base at a macro level and even at a supplier level. What value are you trying to, to, to get? Because if you don't know that, there's no point having it. Um, it's about figuring out how you know who's important and the segmentation approach. So we've talked about that. Um, And then once we know that importance, uh, being able to prioritize the specific types of intervention that we take, um, you know, and back to the orchestra example that I gave you, it's figuring out which sections of that orchestra need to play for a particular supplier. And, And it's also about how does the organization make this happen and what governance does it need to put in place? So uh, I actually ended up restructuring the book quite significantly around these seven facets um, that I don't think quite kind of um, told that story adequately in the first edition. And um, from pra- from being a practitioner in this space and applying these tools, um, I'd kind of refined my thinking much, yeah. much more. Um, I think the, the second bit that, that's in there is, as a result of that, um, I, I also figured out a new kind of some new thinking on how we do that segmentation process Um, and getting that right is is so so important Um, so um, uh, and providing some practical tools that organizations can actually use because it's the one thing that organizations seem to struggle with how do I decide who's important um, so, so those are the, probably the two major changes and everything else as I went through, um, was absolutely relevant. Mm-hmm. So, um, so really it's about making it more kind of implementable. Yeah. Interesting. Well, um, 
if if listeners are interested in finding out a little bit more, if they want to check out the book, if they want to connect directly with you, uh, where are some places that they can find you? Okay, so there's a number of ways to uh, to, to find me. Um, probably the, uh, the the best place is to visit our website, mm-hmm. which is positivepurchasing.com. Um, from there, uh, you can connect with me directly. Connect with me on LinkedIn. Um, and um, and the book uh, and all of the four titles that uh, that I've written are out there um, through Kogan Page on their website, available via Amazon, um, and there are different um, translations um, of these books available as well. So positivepurchasing.com. Yep. Okay, so what I'll do is I'll include the links to positivepurchasing.com. I'll include links to the, the books as well in our show notes page for today's episode. That's going to be at artofprocurement.com slash positive SRM. That's artofprocurement.com slash positive SRM. Jonathan, thank you so much for joining me. You're very welcome. It's been a pleasure. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for listening to another episode of the Art of Procurement. To find an archive of all past episodes, you can go to artofprocurement.com slash episodes. And to ensure you never miss another show, go to artofprocurement.com slash subscribe. Mm-hmm.